So it's a bit of a, a workout to get here, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much for coming to this. Um, interesting times they are, um, and I've got some uh, some interesting details to go through with you guys, so I do appreciate the, was it a thousand steps you've taken to, to get here? Um, <laughs> a thousand steps in the right direction is what that is. Um, so this is a presentation that's formulated on the back of a number of different strands of both practical operational research and on the back of um, integrations inside of systems inside of further education colleges and the benefits that come from that. Um, and so I'm going to lead you on a bit of a journey and I'm going to try and keep to time if I can. I know we're running a little bit late, uh, but I'm going to try and keep to time if I can. Um, so just this is just an outline of the plan. Um, we're going to have a talk about some beans. Um, this will all make sense. Um, I'm going to talk about the myth of free, um, the misdirection of value, big data, little data, and cardboard box. And this will all make perfect sense. And by the end of this session, you'll all be either walking out thinking, yeah, or thinking, still not sure what you meant by cardboard box, but we'll, we'll go with that. Um, this presentation is informed by some of my own personal insights and research, but also I would... And I always like to do this at the beginning of any presentation that I give. I like to recommend some key reading. Um, it brings out the old lecture in me, I'm afraid. But um, some two key books I'd recommend from these are the um, Slater book and the Williamson book on big data in education and learning analytics. Um, without going into some kind of Amazon-led review, um, let me just say that they are both very informed texts for what we're about to discuss. And also, I'd recommend this book. Has anyone come across the Choice Factory before? Wow, okay. Um, behavioral biases and the way that um, they can influence thinking is actually quite an important part of the way um, you can incorporate this kind of thinking into your data analytics and your data analysis. And so I'd recommend, even though this is only a, um, a study of 25 behavioral biases that can influence decision making and thought processes, I would heartily recommend that book as a, a, a brilliant read, um, but B, a really key insight into how behavioral science can greatly inform um, how you plan and how you operate in terms of research and what might come out of that. So just, just some recommendations. And this presentation was informed by all of those. Not ripped off, informed, just a <laughs> borrowed, informed. Okay, so I just want to roll the clock back a bit. Um, many, many moons ago, in a very different guise, uh, a very different weight threshold, um, I was doing some work for um, a huge retail company. I won't say which company it was, but it rhymes with PESCO. Um, and part of that research, um, they wanted to know why people weren't buying the baked beans that they were selling um, in a particular part of the town I lived in. Now, the town I grew up in is a town called Grimsby. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, Grimsby is, was Europe's food town. Um, by Europe's food town, what they mean is um, a lot of food manufacturing and food reprocessing goes on there. Uh, it's always a comforting thought at this point in any presentation I give to say that if you've eaten a fish-based product in the UK, chances are somebody from Grimsby's <laughs> had their fingers on that, which may make you feel sick or not. depends how you feel about fish. Um, so the plan was they wanted to understand the retail patterns um, inside, of, um, inside of what was making people buy certain brands of beans in certain areas. Now, this may not seem like an important piece of research, generally speaking. However... Understanding how the data that informed this will lead on to another discussion which I'm going to have in a moment. What we had to do was not just look at the sales process. It's easy to look at the end point, and this is a curse of FE and HE and a lot of assessments, actually. It's easy to look at the end point as the place where that's where all the magic happens. But in reality, people's decisions are informed by a thousand and one processes along the way, which in some senses are captured here and there. Now, this is before really big data was kind of a thing, but there's always been a big retail information data source which you can access, um, or could at that point access, um, on a scheduled basis. You could buy time into that. And so we had access to the big retail database. Now, to give you an idea of how extensive that particular database at that time was, and this is on the back of all of the club cards and all of that kind of thing, um, they could identify with some degree of accuracy which demographic bought beans on what day, in what place, at what time, and how long it took them to eat them. <coughs> um, and that's just based on the, the formation of the retail patterns of how people bought baked beans in that town. And what they needed to know was which was the most popular, because believe it or not, there was a bean war. Now, you may have missed this war. It didn't get as much uh, coverage as, say, Iraq. 
Um, but it was a big war all the same. Um, and there was a huge retail war in terms of the supermarket chains because Grimsby is an unusual place. It has every supermarket chain in a very small, tiny demographic. And the demographic area of Grimsby in terms of its retail footprint is really unique as well because it crosses almost every boundary. It goes from quite de depra uh, depraved, deprived, and depraved. Um, it goes from deprived all the way up to fairly affluent in a very, s in a very niche microcosm of retail. And so it was a good test bed to try and identify what patterns. And in the end, to cut a very long story short, in the end, um, we discovered that Branston beans were indeed the most popular on a Wednesday in Grimsby. And that meant that um, the small change that it made for them is that they stopped stocking, stocking as many of the other baked beans um, and indeed put more Branston baked beans in the shops. Now, you might think, well, how is that relevant to any of this? That saved them millions and millions of pounds in logistical shipping costs, in over-purchasing, and that was just one strand of the kind of thought uh, processes that they were operating under. So they were using a very early version of larger retail index data and demographic data to align data patterns to make changes further down that would improve the overall retail and the overall ROI of their business, which is the kind of the key theme of this presentation. Let's move on to something else that we discovered. Is everyone familiar with the Hokey Pokey or the Hokey Cokey, depending on which you're on, so everyone knows? Yep, the dance of the Hokey Cokey, yeah. Left leg in, left leg out, it's not rocket science. I, I hope it's not rocket science. Um, there are 65... Um, 6 uh, 65 million people, I think, in the UK now, something like that. Um, one, I think, uh, I think it's one and a half million of those are now over the age of 65. And statistically speaking, based on the amalgamated data, um, if you were to participate in the hokey pokey over the age of 65, and you were outside of Lincolnshire, Greater Lincolnshire, you stood at stood a chance of having a fatality at doing that. So. What it means to say is that the, uh, any, any year that you go over the age of 65 in any of those regions, with bizarrely the exception of Hull, um, if you participate in any kind of activities, especially any kind of activity at a party involving a dance, you're putting yourself at enormous risk. Um, again, why is this mentioned? This is because this is another aspect of um, data analytics, is that when the data strands come together, they can often reveal a number of different things, some things you expect, Beans are popular. Some things you don't. OAPs are in peril when they do the hokey cokey any, any point in Lincolnshire or any, uh, just outside of Lincolnshire. So how is all this relevant to what we're discussing? Well, this leads me on to uh, a, a particular concept. Has anyone come across the article or the, the scholarly article by um, John M. Newman called The Myth of Free? Has anyone come across that? Written in 2017. In that um, paper... Um, and this all does link up, by the way. In that paper, he discusses um, how free, uh, the idea of free, not freedom as in the, you know, the, um, the uh, uh, William Wallace freedom, kind of that kind of freedom, as in the, the concept of, you know, free of charge. Um, how the myth of free is perpetuated and has been in, the in, in terms of the internet for some time and how it has altered the way we perceive value across the entirety of, of what we perceive as the free internet. Um, there's a very famous phrase on the back of this which says if the, fr if the um, product is free, um, then you are actually the product or if, uh, if you're getting something for free. And the freemium model that is perpetuated through a lot of retail, certainly in the times of the internet, has had a, no a knock-on effect in a number of different ways. Firstly, it's meant that everyone perceives content to be free. And this has changed slightly somewhat, but if you think back to a number of years ago, everyone wanted everything for free on the internet, including music, Video, everything was free, and in some senses it still is, although they've now applied some, some obviously some model into that. Um, but the perception of the internet and the information on it being this, f this place where free things can be, um, spilled into the notion that the platforms that can perpetuate there are free. And education bought into that. Education bought into that in a big way, um, in some instances. Because a lot of organisations that I've come across um, are still living in the land of f land of the free, which sounds a bit odd, but they're still living in the land of, um, of free, and trying to base their entire um, digital online strategy around the concept of what might be something that is free, and that it's all to be given away. Now, there's a problem with that, though, and as much as obviously Canvas is an open source product, this isn't to say that open source. This is a different thing altogether. This is this is the idea that if you have an incumbent system inside of your operation. 
and that it's, it's based on something that is free to install, um, that it requires no more thought processes and that is a valued part of your investment strategy. The problem with that is quite simple. It misdirects the value. Misdirects the value of, of what, we, what it is that you're trying to, to achieve. So let's have a, a, a little thought experiment. Now I actually did this experiment for real. So um, if you imagine yourself in a situation where there are three options for a cup of coffee, and this isn't, actually, technically speaking, there almost is one outside, but um, if you've, all you've got in your pocket is a, a five pound note and a two pound coin, five dollar note, if there is such a thing, a two, two dollar coin, if you have those things, and you have three options for coffee, there's a kettle um, and some instant coffee, which is free. There is a um, vending machine, which is 80 pence a cup. Um, but remember, you only have a two pound coin or a five, pound, a five dollar note. Or there is a jug of fresh brewed coffee, um, which there is a honesty box where you can put a charitable don donation of your choice. So which out of those three, if you were sat there, would you choose? Would you choose make it yourself and for free? Would you choose to spend two pound on something instant but quick? Or would you choose pour yourself a cup of fresh coffee and then make a charitable donation? So just how many of you would choose option A? Nobody likes instant coffee. <laughs> <laughs> how, many would, how many of you would choose option B? Interesting. And how many of you would choose option C? Okay. That's pretty much everybody in the room. Very generous souls, you. <laughs> and out of the two denominations, which would you put in the honesty box? Two or five? Two. So we're feeling generous to a point, right? <laughs> um, now, if you had to make that decision, but you only had two and a half minutes in which to drink the coffee, what would you do then? Would you quickly pour yourself on, chuck some money in, and run with a fresh coffee? <coughs> Would you quickly vend something, or would you then choose the kettle, which would it be? <coughs> now, the reason it's an interesting thought experiment, and the reason it's, a, it's about the misdirection of value is because, in reality, if you're sat there, coffee is coffee, it doesn't make a difference, but it's making you think about the, the, the notion of how you might validate your own experience, what you're basing your decision upon. Are you a, the kind of person that likes to really soak in the beans with a nice fresh cup or does it make a difference to how you are and it looks like I have a room full of people that really like a good cup of coffee which I can appreciate however you can apply this kind of misdirection of value so really the, the value is irrelevant the decision you had to make is whether you were going to part with two pounds or five none of you chose to go with five so the idea of you being um, uh, that value of a cup of coffee stretches to about two pounds regardless of its output now the reason this is all quite important is because there has been a great misdirection of value in terms of online. Um, and that misdirection has come in the forms of varying different online platforms. And part of that is a rationale that in order to get some kind of return on our investment, um, we have to understand the terms of the, the contract that we have with that in terms of its, its attributable value to us. So how much value we place in that system and how much value is completely arbitrary compared to what we think it should be. Um, so a coffee for you guys is worth two pounds. Never mind how much it actually might have cost, whether that's a loss leader, whether it's um, yours to even take in the first place, or any of those options. Um, you were going to have that cup of coffee regardless. So um, we'll skip that. So let's have a focus on how we construct an ROI in terms of education then. <coughs> Return on investment is quite a straightforward, logical thought process really. Um, therein lies the most simple version of a, a return investment uh, calculation. You know, your money gained minus your money spent, divided by your money spent times 100 gives you your ROI percentage. Is everyone familiar with the basics of all of that? Yeah, great stuff. However, what happens in education at the moment is there's a fundamental flaw. In some instances, a fundamental flaw. Um, and this is part of the misdirection of value, um, but there's a flaw. Because a return on investment is, is um, hinged upon that bit. <coughs> It is hinged upon the idea that you've got to put money in in order to get money out. But if you're not paying for an online system and all you're providing is lots of content for it, you never put any investment really in terms of value in the first place <coughs> because your value was misdirected by the nature of the myth of free. And so because of that, 
it twists the notion of what our online learning system has become. And that presents a problem. Um, because when you do that, um, you end up with large-scale data issues on the other side because then you perpetuate with that rather than do the very thing that would actually help you, which is think about a different system. Um, so in other words, if you don't put any real terms in real-term investments and don't start doing all that, you're never going to make those required, in, uh, required returns. And the problem with education is how, how is that return constructed? Um, senior managers in organisations... Um, I don't know how many we have of those here. Maybe it could be all of you, for all I know. Um, but senior managers and organisations tend, tend to focus on, well, if I'm, if I'm putting X amount of money in, how much money am I going to save? How is this going to save us this? What is it going to bring? What value is it going to bring? But their value has been misdirected um, because you're not bringing value in terms of cash benefits. You're bringing value in terms of experience, and experiential ROI is very difficult to justify in terms of spreadsheets. However, because um, Canvas and because Canvas in related to other systems can output um, a wide variety of data, that changes the rule slightly. So when systems start to work together in terms of FEs especially, marvellous things can happen. Um, and you can start to redirect that value um, in, in terms of where you can connect the data. So let's do some connection of dots. And this is based on... Um, uh, a lot of uh, investigation and a lot of, a lot of work that I've done across a number of different colleges. Um, one of the biggest drivers of this, by the way, is the fear of the single point of failure. Um, and this comes in the form in terms of education, where you've got a VLE that is supported by the lone person or the lone small team, um, where you've got an, a free system that is supported by a small team of amateur enthusiasts. Um, dangerous things can happen. Um, especially when things go wrong. And let's put it in a different context. If you were going to launch a spaceship to the moon, you wouldn't do it with a lot of interested amateurs, or maybe you would. But would you expect to get there? Maybe. That might be Elon Musk's great, great thing. Um, but when I spoke to some CEOs in a lot of the colleges, the single point of failure was their biggest worry. They couldn't afford to have a system that had a point that where they had one person, and if they went off sick, then the system could never be repaired because it was a troll across the internet to find out. And I can tell you another system that had that problem, the Death Star. <laughs> yeah, if you ever wonder, if you want an instant single point of failure, an example, should never put that exhaust point in. And I know for the purists um, of Star Wars, they might say, well, yeah, but the guy put it there on purpose in the last film and all that. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm going by the original three, the proper ones, none of the <laughs> toy shop variety versions that came out later. Um, so single point of failure, don't be a Death Star, right? Okay. So let's look in terms of how we can connect our data strands. So... Um, the best experience I can explain to you is to connect these four things inside of your FE, uh, FE organizations, and I'll explain why shortly. Your software as a service, your Office 365, your Googles, and all of those. Your finance systems for FE, you might be using Forecast, or you might be using something like uh, Pro Resource. Your CRM could be Pro Engage, it could be any one of 100 of those. And your VLE. And you connect all of those to your SIS. Now, for FE, for FE clients, that might be QL, that might be Unity, that might be, hopefully not Unity, but it might be, um, or it might be Pro Solution. Um, but in combination, the data strands that you can then formulate can remodel the value and then redirect um, the value into ter in terms of what you can really expect to get out of that data. And if we start to connect those, um, I'll skip that one, um, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, if you start to connect those strands, and let me give you an example of how that works. We know a lot about learners before they arrive in FE. Um, we have a detailed, they've spent the last X amount of years at school, of course this is all to be GDPR friendly -fied, um, but they've spent a lot of time at school and we amalgamate a lot of data about those. And that data should inform their process, their progress in FE. It should inform exactly how that, form, how that is formed. Not just in terms of um, their starting point and their minimum target grade, but it should also give you an idea of their global attendance, when they might have had wider issues, and then you can start to put spot data patterns, which you can then use to put interventions in place later down the line. So if you know that that student has particular difficulty with certain concepts, you can create a strand of curriculum for them based on their data pattern, um, which can then be linked into their SIS, into their, into their VLE, which creates a unique data course intervention plan for them. Um, and then further down the line, you've then got a system that is tailored specifically to the data requirements of that user. 
And by that I mean if you know that that student's coming in with certain, certain issues or there's a certain pattern to their attendance, you can, you can utilise that information in a greater or lesser extent to reformulate a curriculum plan that's suitable for them. Um, and I've seen this operationally work where, you've, where they've connected the, and, and analysed the data strands that come through from different systems and formulated those into um, visualisations that you can then use at the um, um, boardroom level um, to make key decisions about which direction you should take things like your online learning courses, what day you should make them available. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, at one particular college, they did their scheduled uh, online in the library and they told the students, they timetabled that particular process. Um, when they analysed the data that came in from the schools um, with this particular group of students, they noticed that there was a, a strand to their attendance which was a bit, shall we say, erratic. Um, and they discovered that, in fact, the better way, using a psychological bias, the better way to get these students to complete their online wasn't to tell them when to do it, was to give them options of when. So instead of saying, right, you're going to do your online learning in the library on a Wednesday, they said you can do it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at this time. And that meant they had 100% compliance within six months of doing that with all of those learners. Um, and that was a simple, small change. The data revealed, um, data revealed when it was under analysis and when it was linked to the SIS data. Now, later down the line, we were able then to link the data that comes out of the data portal to Canvas and start to then use the mastery data because every all the data that's inside of Canvas can be extrapolated and utilised with the right visualisation tool. I used Tableau for that, but there, there, are other, there are other data visualisation tools available. And because you can coordinate and you can link those strands together, you can start to formulate really important strategies on how you can then appropriate and use um, uh, information that pertains to individual students and almost create tailor-made courses and experiences. And that is really, really important because the information that you gather from that um, can mean that your students are generally more on time, more on program, and you're not less necessarily getting lost in the metrics. And that's why this particular slide is quite important. Um, what you tend to find with data <coughs> is that instead of embracing it and looking at it in a large scale, people try and distance themselves from it, so they try and get further and further back so they can see more of the data picture. But as you can see, that, by the way, is the Earth from Saturn, just in case you didn't know. Um, if you get, I mean, there's a lot of information coming out of the Earth right there, but from this point of view, really, it look, doesn't look like much. And you tend to find that with a lot of data patterning, um, really you need to understand what metrics it is that you want to measure and have an idea of those before you then decide what your pattern is going to be and what your plan is going to be to, to utilise that data in the best way forward for your learners. And so when you're planning your student journey, whatever that journey may be, um, you can then start to align all of that information and all of those patterns. Um, and so utilising things like the key metrics that come with all learners so knowing that someone's value added is at a certain point, you can put more stated interventions in to help them get to their minimum, their, their target grade. Um, knowing that there's students out there that have attendance issues, you can then incorporate strategies that using the data analytics that might enable you to engage them online, because perhaps that's a better match for them. Um, you can then use the mastery tools inside of something like Canvas um, to then support ideas that those students perhaps respond better to staged mastery gateways as opposed to having lots of endpoint assessment. And when you start to utilise that big data and then reformat that into the little data, you start to really see that things can come out of the cardboard box. Ah, see. So Canvas already, already outputs a lot of data. I don't know if you can see that very well on there, but that's a, an example of the analytic data and the um, assessment, assessment data that you can get out, just out, out of the box from Canvas. Um, Canvas's strength is that that data is available um, as, a, as a visual aid to all of its tutors. However, the strength of Canvas comes when you start to incorporate that into more visual, into a visual language. The minute you link your SIS system and you have that incorporated with your VLE, you're creating an incredibly powerful data set. Incredibly powerful. Um, and you've got a learner journey that you can see and then once you've got enough data in there, you can start to model that data. So you start to see patterns. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, we noticed that there was drop-off points uh, at certain times of year, at certain times of the evening, so we were able to make courses and make information available at more, more popular times. Um, we noticed there was a spike with people with mobile devices accessing, their, con accessing their, their Canvas courses on the bus. Now, what that meant was that the, the course content that we had in those sh courses needed to be a lot shorter and quicker, 
and more responsive because we didn't want people, people aren't going to sit and spend hours on there, they're just dipping in and out. So we knew that the courses, if we wanted to catch people on the bus or on the way home when they were doing journeys, the content had to be tidied up and made neater and quicker in order for that to, to be a more complete <coughs> journey. And in fact, what it did is it re enabled us to remodel the entire learner experience based fundamentally on the patterns of data that we saw coming out. Um, and then, because of that, we were able to make changes to what kind of things we might buy. So that started to enable us, when we discovered that a lot of the users weren't using iPads, um, we stopped buying lots of iPads. The students told us they wanted to use PC laptops. We were able to get more of those because we could uh, look and see across our data patterns and understand that they, more access came from web browsers at a certain time. We were able to put those in certain rooms in the organizations and start to really utilize that big data to make proper investment changes that, and that then led to real return on investment in terms of inside of the college. And all of that was linked to the big data and the data that we could get outside of Canvas. So that leads me just to say thank you very much for your time. I hope it's been a bit of an insight. I'm available all day. Um, if you want to ask me any other questions, um, probably uh, I think I'll be around all day other than, the, other than some of the talks anyway. So any questions at all about that? <laughs>